All right. Uh, hello, guys. I hope you guys had a good break. Um, hope you guys are ready for another year. Um, we're going to try to start out um, relatively chill, not so much. It, 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 it depends how you look at it. But um, we're going to basically be spending this quarter uh, for the first, like a third to a half, we'll be finished. It will be making the PCDB so that we can order it. And then we'll be shipping out parts for you by probably around week three or four. Um, so you guys can uh, get started with labs and some more hands on stuff. Um, yeah, so, so I guess the outline right now is we're going to have PCB design for three weeks. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this because based on the schematics, we might extend things a little bit. Um, uh, then we're going to do communications for two weeks in sense of fusion. Those are like two main portions of our, our lab. And then by then, hopefully, we'll have all our parts and custom boards um, ordered. So just a rundown of our schedule this year. Um, oh, wait, by the way, as always, if you guys have questions, just inter uh, unmute and interrupt me. It's, it's fine. Um, so week one, we have our lecture. And many of you guys have probably have like multiple uh, different days we want you guys to get your schematics back to us i say general rule of thumb we want it done by about this weekend um and completely turn back to us um right at the moment our our first lab is to finish with tcb um and we'll have the first checkpoint due next tuesday at the moment we might extend it to wednesday or thursday depending on uh, how like because we don't want you guys to burn out and we also want you to focus on school for the first week maybe so um all it is is placing your components down so i personally don't think it'll take too much i think most of you guys for your schematics only have like probably like 20 minutes worth of editing to make maybe a longer once like at, at most an hour um so hopefully this uh, deadline is not too unreasonable um but if there's a problem let us know for this um, and we're trying to make a parts order by that weekend, meaning that uh, we, we definitely want this checkpoint to be due by this week so that you guys can be sure that your footprints and your parts are all consistent and that you, if you're going to make any changes, that's done before we order your components. So this parts order will be all your components, but uh, not your board. Um, then we're going to have the two, next two checkpoints in the next week, and then we're going to have a big design review for the PCB. And when we're done with that, we're done with the boards until we get the actual one. So no more, no more Eagle for, for a long time, probably. Well, well for us, never. <laughs> um, um, and then after that, we'll have uh, the, the labs. And that's basically the rundown. Um, and oh, and this weekend, I'm thinking of doing a Jackbox, another Jackbox social. I know some of you guys came out last time and some of you wanted to come, but couldn't do it on a Friday. So I'm thinking of doing it this Saturday. Um, probably around like six uh, or, or maybe around like five ish. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll make it in, uh, put it in the announcement. Um, right. Uh, and then since we're getting to this point where, especially for PCBs, there's a lot of like small details. We want to make sure that you guys had a resource to work with each other outside as well, um, exchanging ideas with groups. Because back when I did AP, it definitely worked with other groups as well um, to make uh, make sure that we can you know, figure things out. So I made a piazza. Um, so if you guys could like take a screenshot of this right now or um, copy it down um, and join this, that would be really nice. I know that some, some uh, it's pretty hard to work within your group as well. So having multiple boards to kind of work off of will, will be helpful. And so it, it'll be a good place to ask questions. We'll also answer them there as well. Yeah. Um, right. And there's some final like updates to the schematic. And then after this lecture, like today or tomorrow, try to be able to do all of this. Um, first of all, just make sure that everything, uh, mainly your parts, are included your, in your bomb. The only things that we are ordering are listed here. And everything else will see on the bomb. Because some I know some people like didn't put the MCU, didn't put the switches. But all of those are dependent on, on the group. So um, you just have to put it in there, or we, we won't order it. Or at least we won't catch it. The second thing is I want you all to go back and count all your passes. Pretty much like all the groups have like some kind of miscount. Um, and if you miss parts, like me and Aaron are trying our best to count it, but like think of how annoying it might be for you to count your passes and then multiply that by like seven so or six. So um, if, and many of you guys put some extra parts, just put the exact number and we'll order extra um, when we see fit. 
Um, but yeah, just put the exact number. Um, and then the other thing is when you're finally done with your last one, submit a final draft and name it like team and then your number and then AP final. It's just easier for us to uh, uh, see it on our, our computers. Um, also, if possible, um, if you guys could on your bomb, like condense your uh, like passives of the same like capacity, for example, like I know a lot of teams have like several like 0.1 uh, microfarad caps, like the 100 nanofarad ones. And then like some teams have them like split up across a like a lot of different lines where you have like different uh, different 100, 100 nanofarad capacitors. You can just use the same one. You don't need to have like different uh, different capacitors of the same value all across your ball. Just remember for us at the moment, honestly, at the moment, like this next week, having your bomb exactly what you, you might mean it to have is probably honestly more important than having the exact connections because connections we can still change later on, but once we order the parts, like that's it, you know? Yeah. So um, this is like our, I, I'd say priority. So I just wanted to highlight that and make sure you guys have that uh, in, your, in your heads ready to do. Cool. And with that, we'll start going into our lecture today. Um, so as we've gone over before, our quad components, like our sub-circuits, include what's shown on the slide right now. So we have our power. We have the voltage divider for monitoring the, uh, the battery status, our uh, external modules, the radio and the IMU, along with our motors, and of course, our MCU and all of its associated uh, uh, crystal, a uh, programmer, VRM, and all like the decoupling capacitors scattered across our board. And uh, so now we're going to be finally be placing all of our components onto a PCB. So we'll start with what exactly is a PCB. Um, so PCB stands for printed circuit board, and it's like a multi-layered uh, board where um, they use layers of copper and uh and surfaces and polymers as insulators that where you can like essentially create a circuit and it's kind of like uh, instead of like traditional wires on say a breadboard you have copper traces that act like that act as the wires in the circuits and um instead of like terminals that you plug into say a breadboard we have pads and holes that we solder components on and uh, in the image below, we have, uh, I think it's a little bit difficult to see, but you have like traces, which actually do kind of resemble like little wires. You can like physically see where they connect to. And uh, as you can see on like the trace that the arrow is pointing to, it actually connects to a via, which is a little hole. We'll talk about more about vias in a second, but it's like a hole that connects all of the layers of the board together. And um, other features of a PCB include polygon, drill holes, and pads. And pads are what you actually solder the physical devices to, along with uh, drill holes. And the type of PCB that we're going to be using is uh, only two layers, simply because we don't have that many components that we need to solder on. and uh, so that reduces the complexity. And uh, two-layer PCBs are also significantly less expensive to manufacture. And for Eagle, the top layer is going to be red and the bottom is blue for us. And um, all of our SMD parts, we will allow you to place them on both sides. So sometimes uh, the past two years, people have like accidentally misinterpreted the rule as like you can only put uh, components on one side. That's what they do for micro mouse, but because of space constraints, we allow you to put passives on both sides. And uh, through hole components will go through like both sides. So you have to be aware of, you have to be aware that you don't accidentally place pads on top of, uh, like SMD pads on top of through hole components. And one uh, method that we do suggest is that you route traces on one side of the board to make connections and you use vias to like send like uh, essentially a drill to the other side, and then you can continue your connection on that side as well. And the example on the right is actually a pretty common development board. It's the Arduino Mega 2560. And as you can see, it's uh, only two layers for a really like what's considered to be like a pretty complex board. It has like an MCU, a lot of passives, and it has a ton of breakout pins as well.
And so for our two layered board, when you're drawing the physical connections with traces, you'll be using the route tool in Eagle, which is shown above. So um, the top is like your toolbar and it includes like the uh, which layer you're on. It indicates which layer you're on, the bend style, uh, the radius if you're making like a, a circular bend. We don't recommend that really. Um, and the width and via settings. So um, with respect to the layer indicator, we only have two layers. So it'll be either the top, uh, which is the, uh, sorry, the top, which is the first layer or the bottom or 16. And um, with the bend style, we really suggest that people use 45 degree bends. And the reason for this is that if you use say a 90 degree bend, when it comes to manufacturing tolerances, um, when they're printing it, I get, yeah, when they're printing the PCB, there could be uh, errors within like the manufacturing uh, process itself where uh, traces could be misaligned and then uh, certain edges or pieces of the trace may actually not exist when it should be there. And that could result in traces being thinner than we want them to, which can result in bottlenecks and uh, other parasitics that we don't want on our board. And we'll go more in depth on that in a little bit. But uh, using 45 degree bends mitigates some of the issues associated with using 90 degree bends. And with uh, when it comes to width, it defines how wide your copper traces are. And um, using like the PL over A formula for resistivity, wider traces do allow for more current to pass through while also like reducing heat and uh, parasitic resistance. And also more on this in a little bit. And we'll also define the widths that we want you to use for different types of signals in the lab spec itself. And uh, via options, we just want the, the only like parameter that we want is that the size of the drill is the same size as the trace width that you're connecting it to. And when it comes to parasitics, we have, uh, our sources are resistance, capacitance, and inductance. So in the case of resistance, we're limited by our, <clears throat> our traces themselves. And the only thing we really can control when it comes to uh, res a parasitic resistance is width. So as you can see with the formula, you have uh, the resistivity times uh, length divided by area. So the only thing we really can do is increase the width, or in this case, area, to re uh, minimize resistance. So we want traces that are as wide as possible. And next we have capacitance. So as you can see in the uh, image in the middle-ish, um, our two tr two parallel traces can be modeled as like a little parallel plate capacitor and uh, where the capacitance is also modeled by epsilon times area divided by the distance. So the only factor that we really can control since like the height of the traces is fixed is we can only minimize the uh, minimum maximize the distance to reduce the capacitance. Um, although another uh, factor is when your traces are on top of each other. So for example, if you have a trace on the bottom layer and a trace on the top layer, if they're overlapping, that also generates uh, parasitic capacitance. But um, since we are using a lot of ground planes, some of it is unavoidable, but we still do recommend that if you can try to avoid having like traces run parallel to one another. And our last source of parasitic is uh, our, our parasitics are inductance. And using the formula, um, L is equal to N squared times mu A over I, where N is like the number of turns that's fixed. Uh, mu is also fixed and area <clears throat> is somewhat fixed where our, since our height is limited and we want to maximize the width, then the only thing we can control is the length. F. So shorter, uh, shorter traces lead to less inductance. And so in summary, we want to keep our traces wide, short, and far apart to reduce our parasitics. And uh, one way that we do reduce parasitics is using polygons. Uh, so polygons on our PCBs, it's essentially like a really large area of copper. And this large area maximizes our width. So it reduces the resistance resulting in like a really low impedance path for current to flow from one area to the next. But 
Whereas on a trace, you can kind of just like click on two points and then it'll automatically like draw the wire or trace for you. Um, for polygons, you actually have to like physically draw it in Google. And there is a tool for that. And you have to also make sure that you name your polygon, what you, uh, what it's being going to be connected to. So for example, we're going to have four planes, a motor ground, a Re uh, regular, sorry, a uh, motor ground, a regular ground, a 3.3 volt and 3.7 volt. And uh, you'll have to actually name your polygons that as well so that Eagle knows what's supposed to be connected to what. And uh, talking about ground planes, so there is a reason why we use them. So in our case, our power supply, we have 3.7 volts that we supply directly to the motors and to the uh, voltage regulator. And then we have the voltage regulator, which outputs 3.3 volts, which goes to the remainder of our components, including our IMU, our MCU, and our, uh, our IMU, MCU, and the radio. And we also need a, uh, a ground for to connect to essentially bring all that current back to the battery. And so we do have to supply a lot of components to uh, a lot of current to several different components and a low impedance path is essential in our application. And by default, Eagle uses these things called like thermal isolations for the pads connected to polygons. And uh, since these limit the like the current to certain components, we suggest disabling them. So you can see that on some of the components on the right, like there's a uh, like little, uh, instead of having the, uh, like the entire pad connected to the plane, Eagle like kind of like cuts copper, cuts pieces of copper off. So for example, where Eric is pointing right now, you see those like little, uh, like little divots in between that's meant to, uh, like thermally isolate the device. So when you're soldering, it's like, it doesn't take forever. So you don't have to heat up the entire plane before you can solder something onto it. So although it may make it a little bit more difficult, we still suggest taking off since we need all of the current that we can get. And that brings us to bottlenecks. So for example, thermal isolations, it would be a potential bottlenecking source in our circuits, but we're mostly concerned about bottlenecks in planes. Um, so since traces that go through like a pre, uh, predefined polygon cuts through it, for example, on the image on the right, you can see that like MISO signal from the top, it cuts through the existing polygon and then uh, it essentially like draws on top of it. And um, having several different traces on a single polygon can result in uh, sources of high impedance where current flow is limited because of all of these like cuts and like segmentation of the uh, polygon itself. So it's essential to try and avoid these. So can anyone tell me like what is wrong with this uh, image on the right in terms of bottlenecks? You have the MISO um, running all the way to the other side and through basically cutting this whole thing. Yeah. Um, any, any like specific components that uh, that may be bottlenecked or pads. So any is pads that might be bottlenecked. Okay, Eric, you go to the next slide. Yeah. So as you can see on the right, um, because of the, uh, the MOSI and the MISO, uh, MISO traces, they actually like essentially kind of pincer off around this eight pin header on the right, which results in a bottleneck for these two uh, capacitors. And these two capacitors, essentially their only source of current is like this tiny little uh, channel in between all eight of the headers. And that's uh, not very well routed. Whereas um, the example on the right is a much better way of routing it where the Capacitors, they have like that entire channel between the eight pin and the uh, the jumpers in the middle and all the space between the jumpers themselves as well to receive current. 
And for our motor control circuits, our motors can draw up to two amps of current each if we supplied enough voltage. But since we're only supplying 3.7 volts, um, it's significantly less than that. But um, that doesn't mean that they're low current uh, devices. They're, they're not drawing low current by any means. Um, the traces carrying current have to be at least 50 mil thick. And that's you can define that in Eagle itself. And the exception uh, is the PWM signals, the MOSFETs. These can follow the, uh, the analog signal criteria that we set in the lab as well. And we also uh, want to ask you guys to uh, really consider where you place the JSTs for your motors because you're going to have to plug them in. And we recommend putting them on like the edge of the board so they're easily accessible because if they're like in the middle, you might accidentally, like when you're trying to pull them out, or plug them in, you might uh, like, what's it called? like scrape off or uh, put too much force and bump off some of your SMD components if they're not very secured. And easy access to our JSTs is really important, especially when uh, we're, we begin testing. And um, this brings us to another aspect of our motor circuits is isolating our motor ground. As I mentioned earlier, we do want, we ask you guys to separate motor ground from the uh, ground of the other devices. <coughs> this is because motors, um, whenever they're running, they generate a lot of noise on both their power and ground planes. Um, so we, you can separate it by creating two separate ground planes and they connect to each other very close to the uh, battery JST ground pin, not the motor JST ground pins. And um, I think we've talked about this with some other teams as well. Uh, ideally, we do want to separate digital and analog 3.3 volt planes as well. Um, but we don't require it both because of space constraints and because we only have one analog uh, one analog reading, which is from the voltage divider to monitor the battery status. So in total, you should only have four planes, a 3.7 volt, 3.3 volt, and the two separate grounds. Yeah, and a quick note about this, because um, this came up a lot last year. Um, just remember that uh, technically you actually have three planes and uh, three signals in the sense that your motor ground and your ground are still connected. So don't like make a ground two or something. These are both the same ground. We just want to make sure that they're bottlenecked only at one position, and that's where uh, the the um, ground signal is. Whereas for your three point seven and your three point three, they should be completely two different signals and not connected. And another thing is our decoupler placement. Eric will be talking a little bit more about the uh, specifics in a second. But so we've always kind of just told you guys, oh, decoupling capacitors just filter. And we never really said like exactly what they do. So um, our, uh, our ICs, they actually require decoupling capacitors so that they can filter out a lot of noise, which we have said a lot. And they store charge to handle certain spikes in current. And there's going to be an image on that in the next slide. But um, they should, you should place them as close to the ICE, uh, integrated circuit that they're decoupling as close as, as close as possible to those. And uh, parasitic inductance affects the speed at which the charge in these, uh, in these capacitors can be delivered, which is, uh, which brings us back to like the parasitics from earlier. We want our traces as short as possible. And when using multiple capacitors, the smallest capacitances should be closest to the pins. And this is actually something that you might want to remember because I had one time, like it was, this was legitimately an interview question. I was like, oh my goodness, I, I don't remember like what the answer was and I totally boofed it. So yes, always remember smallest capacitance is closest to the pins. And this is like a, a visualization of like what exactly the uh, decoupling capacitors do in practice. And as we mentioned before, they do like filter and smooth out noise that occurs in a signal or in, uh, I guess power is also technically a signal, but um, as shown on the right, just simply adding a decoupling capacitors significantly helps in like maintaining the uh, five volts that's desired in the application shown on the right. So the uh, dark blue is without any decoupling capacitors. And then once they're applied, you can see that um, the, the spikes are significantly reduced and a uh, somewhat stable five volt signal is uh, yeah, and also a reminder, you might be wondering like, oh, five to 4.99 is like not a big difference. That's true. This is like not a big difference at all. But um, this is when the MC is idling. So 
Uh, this it doesn't include like when your motor's running and your motors will introduce a lot of noise, even if you do separate the ground planes as we suggested. Um, and also when you're just uh, running your MCU, it, it'll be much larger than this idling uh, voltage. All right, so, so we talked about decoupling capacitor placement before in a very generic way. And we just said closer is better. And that's why we had you guys, if possible, put decoupling capacitors next to your pins in your schematic. Um, however, there are a few other details that are kind of important. Um, and these are kind of just like uh, examples of what can be acceptable. So this best practice here is exactly what we would want. And it is for um, the decoupling capacitor. These Vs just represent where the signals come from. But it's for the decoupling capacitors um, and your, your pins both to be very close to each other and also for the decoupling capacitor to be very close to your, um, where your power supply is coming from. Um, let's see which example would be a good one to look at. So here, here's an important one that me and Aaron was actually looking at earlier and why this is really bad. Um, as we said before, your decoupling capacitors need to have very low inductance connected to them. Um, so while this looks okay, the decoupling capacitor is right next to the pin, your power supply, your, your uh, 3.3 uh, volts in your ground are actually have to, they have to go through this trace and this is a via to like whatever plane you might uh, have it connected to. Um, and in this case, it's really bad because it has to flow like all the way through this to decoupling capacitor. And the order act of it hitting the decoupling capacitor first and then the pin actually matters. And I'm not going to go into detail on why because it's pretty, pretty uh, in depth. So the two main takeaways to remember is one, to always put the decoupling capacitors as close to the supply pins as possible. And the second one is to always connect decoupling capacitors directly to the power and ground planes, meaning that if you have it like routed to a via or something, make sure that the via to the plane is um, very close to the capacitor. Um, the, the other way to see it is that the plane should hit the capacitor first. Um, if your ground plane is on the backside, it may actually benefit you to put the capacitors on the backside and then use a via to the pin on the top. Um, and this will reduce the inductance from the planes to the capacitors. Because remember, we said that uh, planes um, have the lowest parasitics out of all our connections in our, our board. The other thing is clock placement. Um, as um, we, you probably noticed, the, it, us working with like a few picofarads of capacitance, when you were calculating your um, oscillators capacitances, you had to take into account the pin capacitance and the board capacitance. Um, but as, so. In order for those calculations to be correct, we have to make sure that the capacitor, oh, sorry, not the capacitor, the oscillator and the resonator have to be as close to the pin as possible. Um, and the capacitor should be as close to the oscillator as possible. Um, the parasitic elements uh, from uh, having long traces will completely distort your signals, and especially at these like high 8 megahertz frequencies um, would really mess up what you, uh, how it works. Um, so yeah. Okay, that's it for all the content. Um, it was, thank God, not too long today. Is there any questions? No questions? Okay, I guess we'll just go on. I realized I put this as week three Tuesday and that's actually not what I was supposed to put. I will edit this, um, but uh, just remember, this will be subject to change. So at the moment, there are some teams that are like completely done with their schematics, like complete, like completely done. And some teams still have like some small changes. I highly recommend that you guys just uh, follow this schedule, even if we might end up delaying it, because um, the earlier you get it done, the earlier we can get the PCBs out, the earlier you can get to the labs, and it'll just make all our lives a lot easier. And also. Cramming something like PCB design like never works. It's one of those things like doing a CS project, for example, where it could take like an hour, it could take like 10 hours. But if you're stressed and trying to cram things, you'll definitely get a lot of problems. Um, so let's try to start early. Um, I know the checkpoints seem to be very close together, but the reason we did that was before we actually had no checkpoints and it was just, just like, uh, they just said like, do it. <laughs> and then we did it in like three weeks. So uh, this is just to help us uh, give you uh, feedback throughout the process and also um, uh, for you to uh, pace yourselves. 
Um, so checkpoint one is just to place all your components on the board. Shouldn't take too long at all. Um, checkpoint two, we're going to work on your power planes and your power system, as well as your motor driver. And then checkpoint three will be uh, everything else that you have. Um, and I guess I'll go in more detail. For checkpoint one, you really should put a lot of thought into how you're going to put things. Um, it will completely make or break your board, and there's a good chance you're going to end up changing where you place things as well. Um, but just putting a lot of thought in the beginning um, might help a lot. So, and remember that you have two sides of the board. That's very important. And so let's just look at an example on what to look out for. This is one of the uh, team's board. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm like placing things just randomly. I'm like, OK, I'm going to place this MCU on the top left corner of this rectangular board. And then let's say we put the motor ne right next to the MCU, so like on this right side, and there's like four motors right here. Um, oh, on the top edge. I don't know why I said bottom edge. Um, so immediately, does anyone see any problems might occur from this? And you see the motor traces are right here, and your motors are going to be along the edge of the board right here. And even if you guys don't want to answer, just give it some thought, some thought for like a second. Just look at all the other signals. You have like an SDSCL here, might get blocked off. You put this on the left of the board where you're going to put all these signals, you know. So we'll just go in to this example. Here's how we'll essentially look at it, right? So here's a top left. And here we connect all these to your, your MOSFETs, OK? So remember the SDA and SCL pins, which are right here. You can't actually see it <laughs> very well but are on this top side, how are you going to connect these? That's a big question. And even then, um, how is this top left power supply? So you see how these are, this power supply is connected. How is it going to be, uh, get a clean signal? Because it's going to be bottlenecked. Imagine even after like filling all the other lines, this will completely not get power from your voltage regulator, which will be somewhere else on the board. Um, and the other thing is, remember we said 3.7 has to be, uh, the sig plane for the motors. If you put a plane here, how are you going to split this up so that the MC still gets that? So there's just a few questions you should think about. Imagine like where your planes are going. Imagine like uh, that all your routes are kind of going in one direction, um, and just make sure everything can be connected when you place them. Because once you place them, and you start routing. Um, um, what what you do in placement really matters. So checkpoint two. Um, I, I wrote this all down as a suggestion for later. Um, it, it's just for documentation, so I won't go over it. But um, the biggest thing is just to come check in with us as, as much as you can. Um, you don't want to like uh, misunderstand something and then connect everything incorrectly. Um, and then like I just wrote this example because I was like, this is something that would totally happen. Let's say you like connect all five your decoupling capacitors and then only for us to tell you that has to be redone. Then you have to reroute everything. But then because you reroute everything, you have to add like new vias. They block some other signal, make a bottleneck. Now you need to replace like your MCU or like something else. So uh, now you need to basically redo like half your board. So you should have just like asked us first. Like this is legitimately something that would happen. Like I've had friends who would redo. <laughs> They're pretty much half their board because of one small yet important detail. So the biggest tip is just to check in with us. Whenever you have a question, just ask. Um, okay, checkpoint three, we're going to do something a little different this time. And we're not being strict for the sake of being strict, um, but for the sake that we of having to, one, lighten our load. So because all our design reviews have been in like one day for the last two design reviews. Um, so we want to spread it out more. And the other thing is because um, we want to order the, order the boards. And we don't want to delay everyone else's boards if one team was, was late this time, right? So this time, we're going to be really strict and deduct $10 from your deposit if you don't finish our design review. I did mention the lab spec, we will also deduct five for the first and second checkpoints. I'll be a little, I think we're going to be a little more lenient on the first checkpoint just because um, what we realized about the schematics. Um, and if you let us know beforehand, we can definitely work something out. But in this case, for this last design review, I, I really don't see a world where this changes. Um, and we're going to be really strict about this just for the sake of uh, respecting like every other team. Um, yeah, so everyone's due date will be on the first day before the design review um, and not when your design review is. So we're going to have you submit it and we're going to look it over. And if it's not up to par or um, a not um, 
like complete, then we're going to have to deduct money from your deposit just for the sake of um, the extra cost of ordering. All right. Other announcements. All right. I said Saturday at seven. I hope that works for people. I might ask some people, like some people privately, to see if they can come. But I'm excited to play some more Jackbox. It was really fun last time. <laughs> um, the other thing is we'll be shipping parts out to that uh, in the next coming days. Probably not coming days. Maybe in like the next like one or two weeks. The other thing is ordering soldering iron heat guns. I'm really glad that everyone was said they were willing to buy the essentials. So. Um, and that means that we get to save money and everyone gets their own set of drone parts, which is definitely really cool. Um, and the other thing is that I know we I talked to some teams about MyDAX. Um, some of you guys might already have it. For those who don't have it, it's like two, $200 or something, two, $300. You can probably um, find them used for like a hundred. And if yeah. anyone's in Westwood, you guys can borrow mine. I don't think I need mine until spring or two. Yeah, yeah. So um, that is going to be, very important for your debugging and not only that you're going to it's like required if you want to graduate electrical engineering so <laughs> you, you're going to have to buy it anyways um within like the next year maybe so i uh, might as well get it um and then in, in terms of this you'll definitely need this so i recommend if you guys want to start buying them like be my guest you can ask us about what you should be getting um and yeah and that's all. That's all for today. Thank God it didn't take too long. Yay! Uh, is there any? Oh, one thing I I didn't really mention was at the very beginning. I I, I don't know if you guys saw it, but uh, right, we're gonna have four lectures, um, this quarter. Um, I'm not sure about this date. This date date might change, but these lectures will not take long because this one's a refresher. This one's like maybe two thirds of one of the old lectures, and then the last one is barely even a lecture. We just want to make sure that we can check in off and, and um, spread it out a little more. Yeah, the last lecture probably will only be like not even 10 slides. It's just like yeah. soldering. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So is there any questions like logistical or um, um, or about the content thing? Uh, could you go over what bottlenecking is again? I think I understand it basically, but kind of missed out on a bit. So, so bottlenecking is the concept of creating an, a, a look, an area where there's a very thi uh, thin and the term bottlenecked path. Okay. Um, so if you, um, this is one example, um, and this is kind of an extreme case where it's just like one very fully thin line. Um, the main con concern here is if we go here to the, the circle is that this so this red plane is, um, let's say, like the power plane. So like like three point three volts or something. And let's say this is your pad for I don't know some uh, some people's like oscillators have three point three signal. Um, but let's say this is a pad for some three point three volts. In order for current to come from, let's say this is where your battery is supplying current to, it has to go like through the plane. And normally it like kind of disperses outwards because. Uh, current typically like separates um, and it makes it so it's low current density, low resist, uh, resistance, well, yada, yada. Um, and then it has to go through this very thin area. So anywhere where you have like a signal, like a power signal, like a ground or 3.3 volts that doesn't have a clean access uh, will be bottlenecked. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. And then that kind of shows up a lot with MCU power pins. Like this one is going to be a real problem if you place it, which is why we suggest placing your MCU kind of near the middle of the board. One thing I, I do want to remind people is that you can rotate your MCU like 45 degrees. And I know that some people find that really, really helpful because you can go and like, you, you'll, you'll see when you think about it, you might want to do that. But in this case, yeah, this, this like pin has very little access to it if like your voltage regulator is like on the right side somewhere. Yeah. Oops. Good question. Any other, anything else? Oh yeah, one thing I just want to mention, I, I know I kind of went over it, but yeah, this, you know how I said it's the same signal? You're literally going to 
be drawing with the polygon like what it what it looks like and it, it, you'll see it in the, the lab i think yeah Okay. Oh, if there's no other questions, I guess we're good today. You're free to go. But yeah, thanks for coming. Um, definitely. Just, Thank you, guys. Yeah.